Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here and I had a subscriber ask a question which I'll flip in right here. He basically wanted to know what I think about uh, muscle fiber distribution. Are there some people who are just born to be distance runners, some people who are born to be football players, uh, etc. So uh, let me put on my plus five out of weaponsmithing. Let's do a little bit of crafting and let's talk about just that. All right, uh, basically there's a lot of factors involved in someone being born to be great at a certain sport. All right, it's not just muscle fiber distribution. Muscle fiber distribution is real. I'm gonna get into that in a minute. But honestly, muscle fiber distribution doesn't matter in the, at the amateur level in most sports. It's not a big enough difference to really matter uh, for middle of the ground competitors. It really only starts to matter when you start getting up to like the top 10% of the field. Then muscle fiber distribution start to matter. And you know what, in some sports, it's not really that relevant because some sports require a combination of endurance, conditioning, speed, power, things like that. In those cases, sometimes a certain muscle fiber predistribution like uh, football, uh, basketball, some types of MMA, some types of contact sports, combat sports. Uh, there's such a diversity of skills required with different performance elements that a single muscle fiber distribution subtype is not going to dominate that sport at the top levels. Now, Olympic lifting, marathon running, things like that, muscle fiber distribution will absolutely matter at the upper echelons, but it's not gonna matter in the lower part of the field because the differences aren't that massive. You're talking about muscle fiber distribution probably in the most extreme cases is gonna give someone a, maybe a 10% advantage over the average person. All right, so basically pound for pound strength, uh, someone who has a very, very strong dominant swords, fast twitch fibers, uh, might get about 10% more power, more strength on a pound for pound basis. Uh, you know, so uh, again, 10% is an enormous difference when you start getting into the upper levels of a field. But someone could still compete in powerlifting uh, quite successfully. They're not going to be a champion who is very much uh, stamina oriented as far as their muscle fiber distribution. Someone could also compete in marathon running and run a marathon just fine who's genetically more geared the other direction. They're not gonna have the best time in the marathon. Uh, they're not gonna beat the top contenders who have a different muscle fiber distribution, uh, but they'll be able to compete. They'll be competitive, just not at the upper levels, as long as they can put in the work and they're healthy and, and everything else. Um, but when you start getting into multi-discipline sports, uh, that doesn't matter so much because you know you play to your strengths. A football player or an NBA player, um, they play to their strengths and to their abilities on the field. They adapt their play style. Uh, in any complex sport like that, they adapt their play style uh, to suit their strengths and weaknesses. And that's what a good athlete does. That's what a champion does. Someone who wins in any of those sports, it's about adapting what they have. Now. There are other genetic factors that could come into play tremendously, tremendously. And that's gonna be little bitty things. Um, even for power and strength and everything, uh, different limb lengths, different muscle insertion points are gonna affect leverages. Those are very, very important genetic components. Uh, how about marathon running? Why is the fact that all the best marathon runners in the world come from the same little part of Africa? And people say, well, it's because they're black. No, it's not because they're black. Most black people don't have that genetic subset either. 99% of people from Africa or living in Africa still are not the top marathon runners in the world. There's a couple of little tribes that absolutely dominate marathon running at the world level. It's not just their muscle fiber distribution. It's the fact that they have less calf muscle. They have something like 30% less muscle fibers in their calves than every other group of people in the world. Uh, on average, it's that they're way, way less. They have less muscle fibers. That gives them lower swing weights for their, their lower limbs. That means they burn less calories, use less fuel, use less oxygen to run the same mile, even at the same body weight. Now, that would suck for someone who wants to lose fat because they would burn less calories running. But for someone who wants to be able to run 50 miles and make good time doing it and eat less food to get there, it's an enormous, absolutely enormous genetic advantage. Now, these, these uh, tribes of people are also very, very much uh, slow fit, twitch fiber dominated as well, but they've got another genetic advantage. It's the same thing with different sports. Uh, there are sports that we're having fantastic agility and balance. 
or amazing eye-hand coordination is going to give you a tremendous advantage. It's a lot of these little sub-skills, different genetic traits matter in sports. Muscle fiber distribution is just one component of it. Uh, it matters at the top levels of the sport, but it certainly doesn't matter in the middle levels of any sport, sometimes even at the professional level, depending on what the sport is. Now, you're not going to go to the Olympics and Olympic lifting. Uh, you know, you're not going to go to the Olympics and lifting, lifting unless you're fast switch dominated, but you could still compete at the sub world level probably. You could be a good power lifter too. You know, so look at it that way. Now, as far as the other thing goes, when it comes to muscle fiber distribution, humans as a species already have a given distribution. So you're talking about just distribution within our species. Humans actually are built for stamina. Well, if you look at our, do a muscle biopsy of humans, particularly our legs, and compare our muscle biopsy results to other mammals, um, everything from gorillas, chimpanzees, to horses, cows, cats, dogs, you check our muscle fiber distribution, we are slow twitch dominant. We are a stamina dominant species compared to most other species of mammals. Um, we are designed to run out on the open plains uh, and we're very, very good at it. We are fantastic endurance runners. Uh, that's one of the things you'll notice. The only humans who suck at endurance are people who are out of shape, who've been sedentary. Humans who actually do cardio every day, uh, humans who actually start jogging, if they start jogging every single day and get used to it, humans actually are amazing, amazing endurance runners. Uh, we are marathon runners, just normal people who just pick up marathon running. Uh, you got to think about it. Most of these other animals run all day anyways. So it's not like they're not trained also. Humans will outrun most other mammals given enough stretch of open land to run them down. Uh, we do know humans can do this. Humans can outrun zebras, horses, antelopes if they are given enough miles of open land to do it in. A human who runs all the time and who's trained up in running, which again, our ancestors all were. People need to remember our pre-ancestors going back tens of thousands of years were not out of shape like we are in the modern sedentary world. Um, Hunter-gatherer tribes are not sedentary. You go out and look at the, the, these open plain lands out in Africa still, the indigenous tribe living there, they're not sedentary. They will run you into the ground because they run all the time. They will also outrun these animals. They can absolutely outrun any of those uh, four-legged animals. Given enough miles and enough hours and days to do it, they will run them down and exhaust them. Um, we are fantastic at endurance. So keep that in mind. When we're talking about these muscle fiber distributions, we are talking about distributions within a species that actually has a fairly extreme dominance one-sided already. So honestly, even our top athletes uh, for strength and power who are the really, really fast switch dominated by human standards compared to a lot of other animals, they're still endurance oriented. Um, we are pound for pound, very, very weak as a species. Even our strength athletes, our Olympic strength athletes and our top level power lifters are, as far as mammals are concerned, pound for pound, not particularly strong at all. Even our best athletes, they're okay. They're, they're okay, but they're below average compared to a lot of other animals. Um, again, your, your dog, look at a sled dog, a sled dog, a 55 pound sled dog will out pull a 200 pound athlete when you hook a sled up to him. He will drag your ass into the ground. He is more powerful than you are on a pound for pound level. A female chimpanzee will make an ass out of you deadlifting. You guys are like, oh, I deadlift 600 pounds. In the animal world, compared to other apes who weigh less than you, your 600 pound deadlift is laughable. It's pathetic. Okay, I mean, maybe if it was 1,200 pounds, that would be something, but not 600. So people need to remember, we are an endurance oriented species, but yes, there are individual variations within the species but it takes a lot more than muscle fiber distribution uh, to make you really, really good in a competitive environment against uh, other athletes. Because you have to remember, you know, people have different attributes. And uh, so it's to say there are people who are born runners compared to others. Yeah, absolutely. Again, look at those tribes in Africa um, that do that. They're amazing runners genetically. And it's uh, purely uh, int it's interesting how they got there, you know. Uh, generations of starvation in that area caused them to need a lower metabolism. The fastest way that they found a mutation that gave them the slowest metabolism to survive that starvation was left ca less calf muscle. So something like starvation, which is awful, I mean, it's terrible that, you know, you, you got to look at that from that perspective, how these traits develop. 
I mean, these traits really suck that they have to develop because you're like, wait a minute. So you're saying that 99% of the people in that area who had more calf muscle starved to death. Man, that sucks. That's terrible. I mean, when you think about it that way, it gave you some amazing distance runners. But man, only the top 1% there survived. The other 99% starved to death over several generations. Man, that sucks just because they had too much calf. Something bodybuilders always talk about is a great thing, great genetics. Well, in that case, it was terrible genetics. You died. Survival of the fittest for that environment. You know? And the, just various traits are that way. You know, we get these various traits that become dominant in certain areas, and they're oftentimes because that trait was required to survive in that little region. And so, you know, these various traits get mixed and matched because we spread out over the world, you know. All these different tribes and groups uh, develop these traits. And this idea that we didn't breed across various lines all through history and different tribes that maybe developed 200 years apart and developed certain traits didn't crossbreed, you know, 100 years later. It's just not true. We did. We did. The, uh, the trait that you're seeing there in Africa uh, with those tribes is actually a fairly recent development. It's not something they developed 10,000 years ago. Um, it's going back to somewhat more recent history than that. So it didn't have time to spread out from that region uh, like a lot of these traits do. You know, little bitty things like blue eyes started like in Spain. And it spread all up through Europe, all the way, you know, to the Scandinavian countries. It didn't originate there. It didn't originate there at all. It originated in Spain. I believe, I believe that's where they determined that it did. So it's just interesting how these traits spread. But, you know, you think about it, a lot of these traits uh, came at a lot of death. A lot of death. A lot of people died who needed that trait and didn't have it in that region for it to become dominant. Um, but, you know, it's created some interesting things in the, in the human race. It's given us some interesting diversities and it's made it to where, you know, sometimes our performance seems so dramatic from person to person when we get into top level sports because, you know, you get into these different sports and people who just had that right, perfect combination of six or seven different genes to be amazing at that sport. They're just a born athlete for that sport. And if you combine that with them putting in some serious work ethic and some good coaching, you know, that's how you get champions. That's how you get world champions. And it's interesting how how these things are when you look at them. But usually you'll find for, for most sports, it's not a single genetic trait like muscle fiber distribution that makes or breaks you. Sometimes it's six or seven completely different uh, traits. Um, so it's, it's a little more complicated than something like that. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.